Improvement. 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 That should have been ours. Who dares wins. That was the battle cry of the 1988 Army football squad. A group of young men who set their sights on some lofty goals and then went about achieving those goals. They would be remembered as a team of cadets who took West Point to their third postseason bowl game. A team who would not lose a game at Mikey Stadium. And the team who would bring home the Commander-in-Chief's trophy. No team worked harder than this one. They were disciplined, relentless, and proud. They practiced together, studied together, and won together. And their accomplishments will go down among the very best ever at the Academy. For the 1988 Army football team, dared to win. In many ways, the 1988 Army football campaign was a season in the sun, and it was appropriately capped off with a holiday trip to the Sun Bowl. The city of El Paso welcomed the cadets with the old-fashioned brand of friendliness made famous here in the scenic southwest. Uh, the Sun Bowl has a reputation for being the very best, the very most attractive of the non-New Year Day, New Year's Day games. It has certainly proven to be that way. Our players have had a marvelous time. Uh, the facilities and the committee and the hospitality and uh, every aspect of the whole trip has been superb. This was Army's third bowl game appearance since 1984 and would pit them against the mighty Crimson Tide of Alabama. For the entire Army team, the trip was filled with good times and great fun. The cadets enjoyed seeing head coach Jim Young wearing several different hats, as well as witnessing another country's sporting spectacle, Mexican bullfighting. You know, if you graduate at West Point in May at the normal... Perhaps the trip's most memorable moment came at the graduation ceremony of the December class of 1988. Its one and only member was tight end Ed Schultz. Schultz had fought a courageous battle against cancer in 1985 and 1986 and was able to return to the academy and to the team and graduate in 1988. Right arm. Class of December 88, dismissed. For many here at West Point, Ed Schultz's accomplishments alone would be enough to call this season a success. Game day, as the Black Knights of Army took to the field, the experts were calling them 14-point underdogs. By game's end, however, it would be a different story, one which saw these cadets win many of the day's battles, only to lose by a single point in the final minutes. The contest provided a classic matchup of power versus power. Army's nationally ranked wishbone rushing attack versus a Crimson Tide rushing defense that was ranked fifth in the country. These cadets, though, would not be intimidated. On their very first possession, they drove 70 yards, all on the ground, led by junior fullback Ben Barnett's 51-yard breakaway run. Halfback Mike Mayweather put the ball in the end zone and Army was up by seven. The relentless wishbone continued to roll and by halftime it chalked up 232 yards on the ground. 
30 of which came on this textbook option play. Brilliant execution by quarterback Brian McWilliams and a critical downfield block by split end Chris Destito put Army ahead 14-3. Defensively, the Black Knights were able to keep Alabama off balance for most of the first half. Big plays by nose guard Dan Cooney. Linebacker Troy Lingley. And linebacker Greg Gadsden helped to keep the tide out of the end zone until the final seconds of the second quarter. In the second half, Ben Barnett continued to gobble up big chunks of yardage. Against a defense that allowed less than 100 rushing yards per game, the elder statesman of this youthful backfield ran for a career-high 177 yards, including a third-period tackle-busting burst for 58 yards. set up another Mike Mayweather touchdown blast, this time from three yards out. One minute later, the Army defense would strike when number 14, cornerback O'Neal Miller, picked off a pass and raced 57 yards for an Army score. Crimson Tide would come back in the fourth quarter and escape with a narrow victory. But for this Army team, the coaches, the cadets, and all those associated with Army football, the 1988 Road to the Sun Bowl would long remain a season to remember. As the cadets opened the new year, many eyes turned skyward for a prediction for the 1988 season. The answers looked positive, and Army's squad was ready to meet the challenge. That first game is a really key game of the season because if you lose, well, you start on a down note, but if you win, they get you going in the right direction, and it's a, it's a positive start to everything that you've, you've worked for in the previous months. This is the new team that you're putting out there, the new product of a whole off season, and um, people are expecting good things from, from you that first week. With expectations running high on opening day against Holy Cross, head coach Jim Young had faith in his defense but wondered where the offensive unit would find its leadership. Only two starters returned on offense. There were quarterback questions and an entirely new offensive line. Not to worry, though, as Young would call on his veteran place kicker, Keith Walker, to get the unit going. And Walker responded with three first-half field goals for a lead Army would never give up. The Crusaders came into Mikey Stadium riding their high-powered offense through a 12-game winning streak. The brakes were quickly put on their scoring express, as the Black Knight defense allowed only a first-quarter field goal, shutting Holy Cross out for the final 45 minutes, holding them to just 54 rushing yards and forcing three costly turnovers, one of which was this Pat Davey interception. In the second half, the Army wishbone got on track, putting together a 16-play, 86-yard drive, with sophomore Mike Mayweather going in for his first touchdown of the year. The scoring was capped off with a 68-yard airstrike from quarterback Otto Leone to Sean Jordan. The win marked the 100th career coaching victory for Jim Young and his fifth opening day victory at West Point. Mm -hmm. 
Army invaded the University of Washington's Husky Stadium for the first time ever and undoubtedly left a lasting impression on the Pac-10 power. Coming in as three touchdown underdogs against the country's 17th ranked team, the cadets fought Washington tooth and nail, outrushing the Huskies and gaining more total yardage, despite both Ben Barnett and Mike Mayweather being knocked out of the game. Stepping in was halfback Calvin Cass, who scored his first touchdown of the season. Otto Leone hit Sean Jordan for their second scoring connection of the year, this time from 56 yards out. The wishbone attack had the Huskies perplexed all afternoon. They were stunned by the heart and soul with which these cadets battled. And while the Huskies came away with the game's victory, the cadets left Washington with a respect and confidence that would carry them throughout this season. Army returned home to Mikey Stadium to take on the Wildcats of Northwestern and quickly found themselves trailing 7-3 at the half. It would be a critical point in the early season, and the cadets would respond accordingly. The defense took on the attitude of, let's make something happen, and the offense acquired the spark of consistency in sophomore quarterback Brian McWilliams. In the second half of the Northwestern game, when we uh, trailed, uh, that we came back, the defense was exceptionally uh, strong, didn't allow the Northwestern to do anything in the second half, and the offense started to uh, move the football, as also the first uh, half that uh, Brian McWilliams played, and although he didn't make any big uh, plays himself, I thought that he did a good job of uh, running the offense and, and taking the team down the field. On Northwestern's very first play of the third period, defensive back Mike Thorson intercepted a wildcat pass, igniting a second-half Army scoring blitz. Fullback John Barth carried the ball 48 yards downfield on one play. And Calvin Kaz then put it in the end zone for a lead Army would never relinquish. Cass rushed for 142 yards and two touchdowns in a game which saw two more Army touchdowns in the second half. The victory over this Big Ten opponent marked the start of a seven-game winning streak for the Cadets. Army fans leading the charge, the West Point football team was building up a voracious appetite for victory. The cadets would devour Bison, Eli, and Leopards on their way through a three-game offensive spree, which saw them chew up over 1,400 yards in total offense. Against the Bucknell Bisons, Army put 58 points on the board at one stretch scoring on seven consecutive possessions. Meanwhile, the cadet defense bludgeoned Bucknell, making the Bisons cough up the ball on five different occasions. The following week at Yale, Army's attack was at full strength with the return of running backs Mayweather and Barnett. Each would score a touchdown, as would quarterback Brian McWilliams, leaving no doubt at this point who was the number one signal caller. Sean Jordan scored his fourth touchdown of the season on a 32-yard touchdown pass. Army's homecoming stacked them against the Leopards of Lafayette, and it took the cadets only five minutes to make Army football history. When Mike Mayweather crossed the goal line, it marked the 57th consecutive game in which Army had scored a new school record they would extend through the end of the season. Mayweather and Barnett picked up where they left off the previous week, gaining a combined 315 yards of rushing offense. With the Army offense averaging 29 points per game and the defense allowing less than half of that, this Black Knight squad was now 5-1, heading into the second half of their season of accomplishment.
Meadowlands, where Army had never won a game, the cadets completed only one pass against nationally ranked Rutgers. But what a strike it was. Mike Mayweather took Brian McWilliams' throw for 48 yards. The ensuing score initiated an awesome 15-minute period of dominance that firmly established the character and ability of this 1988 Army football team. Pounding out more than 230 yards on the ground in the first half alone, the cadets showed some razzle-dazzle as Sean Jordan sped past a field full of red helmets for a 41-yard touchdown. It was a key game for us, and I think in the first half, uh, we were at our best uh, because the defense uh, completely dominated Rutgers. Uh, they got, I think, only maybe one first down in the first half. And offensively, uh, we scored 24 uh, points. Uh, so that, that was our best uh, half of football uh, for the year, and I think it was when we really became a football team uh, because from that point on, uh, we knew that we had both an offense and a defense. It took a total team effort to subdue the Scarlet Knights, for even with that great first half, this game would be won in the trenches. The difference proved to be a cadet offensive line that cleared a path for one final game-clinching drive. The first half really told us, it said, hey, uh, they're not better than us, we can play with these guys. You know, they might have beat Michigan State and Penn State, but hey, we can play with them too. I felt like the, the way they were playing their defense, they were really taking away our outside game. And so on the last drive that we had, we, uh, the line felt real confident to just run it up the middle because we'd been able to do so all day. And uh, so Coach Young uh, basically called a bunch of uh, inside the perimeter uh, plays. And you get your thrills out of playing ball when you know you take the ball and you drive it uh, the length of the field, you know, with inside plays, you know, hey, the backs did a great job. But as an offensive lineman saying, hey, yeah, but, you know, they had to do it right at the middle, whereas you had to get your blocks for the backs to be able to run. There was pride in the stride of offensive lineman Mike Braun, Mike Karsanovich, Bill Gebhards, Frank Brunner, and Jack Fry. They had marched Army to a tremendous victory over a highly rated Rutgers team. And these happy cadets and the Corps knew this football team was something very special. On the morning of the Air Force game, Army discovered it had gained a partner, the weather. It was typical West Point weather. Well, it was cloudy, it was rainy, it was really wasn't that cold, but it was kind of miserable weather. And uh, it's the kind of weather we like to play Air Force in. It, last time they were here, it rained and it was very cloudy, and we beat them. So we, were, we felt comfortable with them coming in here and the weather being like it was. The weather was perfect for Army's relentless option attack that confused and frustrated the Air Force. Running outside or inside, the cadets hammered at the visitors, keeping them guessing and off balance. Then, early in the second period, a gutsy but well-calculated fourth down call turned this struggle in Army's favor. It was fourth and, and short on approximately their 40-yard line uh, in the second quarter of the game, and they were ahead seven to nothing. And so we faked one of our inside runs, and the quarterback kept the uh, ball on a bootleg around the uh, far end, and uh, Air Force was completely fooled, and he ran the ball down to about the 10-yard uh, line. Uh, the circumstances were uh, set for that uh, because uh, earlier in the year I'd watched uh, San Diego State run the same play against Air Force in a short yardage uh, situation. At that time, it was a, a good gamble. Now, the Falcons didn't know what to expect as McWilliams finished an impressive 82-yard drive. The Army ground game again proved devastating. Sophomore Mike Mayweather's 192 yards on the ground would be the 10th best single game effort in the history of Army football. For the game, he outrushed the entire Air Force team. When Ben Barnett scored, the cadets surged to a lead which proved insurmountable. 
There were many heroes on Army's defense this day, a tough, aggressive group that bottled up Air Force's offense. Defenders like Mike Thorson, O'Neill Miller, Chuck Schretzman, Troy Lingley, Josh Haynes, Will Huff, Dan Cooney, Pat Davey, Daryl Sherb, and Ernest Boyd simply build a roadblock in front of every Air Force attempt. But it took a clutch fumble recovery by Greg Gadsden to give Jim Young's cadets the momentum they needed to clinch a coveted victory over Air Force. We needed to make a big play, and I remember Troy saying, we need a turnover, we need a turnover. And uh, that very next play, uh, uh, Dallas uh, and the fullback had a bad exchange, and I had been trailing them all, all day long, and I happened to be right there when the ball came out and fell right on it. Three plays later, McWilliams converted the turnover into a touchdown, and Army was about to wrap one arm tightly around the Commander-in-Chief's trophy. The Cadets' ball control offense rode the legs of McWilliams, Mayweather, Barnett, and Cass for 394 yards rushing and held possession for just under 36 minutes of the game. Army had not only whipped the Air Force, but had dominated both sides of the ball. They now needed only a victory over Navy to return the Service Academy Championship to the banks of the Hudson. One of the keys to the success of this Army team was a helmet-rocking defense. According to Jim Young, the best he's ever had at West Point. often been called the most beautiful spot in America to watch a college football game. Mikey Stadium is the setting as the cadets put their six-game winning streak on the line against rival Vanderbilt. The visitors from the Southeastern Conference were stunned by Army's powerful ground game and a brilliant scoring run by Brian McWilliams. The play was you know, basically one of our triple option plays and I made a, a good cutback. They had a lot of speed where they had over pursue and uh, I cut back on him and, and found some daylight and I got some good blocking and I just made it to the end zone before they got to me and it was a pretty big play at the time. Army's defense pounded every white helmet it could find, choking Bandy's aerial game and dominating the interior. Linebacker Troy Lingley's 24 tackles sparked this cadet defense that put up one of the finest goal line stands of the year stopping Vanderbilt cold after a first and goal at the one. The defense kept the struggle close and it took a tense game-ending drive to pull out a victory. Again, it was Brian McWilliams at his finest. We got together just before we went out and we knew we had to sustain a long drive to make sure we won this game. Uh, and we got together and we started clicking again as, as a unit. And once our offense starts playing really well as, as a team, everyone uh, doing their, their job, it's, it's really hard to stop us. We've, we've had a lot of success when, when we start playing together. Nine plays, 63 yards. The cadets would not be stopped. The pride and poise of this team had again proved vital when it was needed most. The 
defense stood tall one more time as Ernest Boyd's interception ended Bandy's final effort. And Army celebrated its seventh straight victory of an amazing season. A unique once-in-a-lifetime journey to Dublin, Ireland was next for the playing of the Emerald Isle Classic. Army's game with Boston College took the cadets on an educational trip far from home to meet and visit people of a different culture. The cadets and eagles would play the first major college division 1A football game ever on the continent of Europe. As part of Dublin's Millennium Celebration, each and every cadet enjoyed his role in this historic event. A special group of cadets took a very meaningful trip to Dublin hospitals, visiting and cheering up many less fortunate than they. Then it was on to football as Mike Mayweather thrilled the more than 40,000 fans in attendance and a nationwide ESPN television audience with a 72-yard kickoff return. In spite of a setback to Boston College, the cadets' brilliant record gained them a berth in their third bowl under Jim Young, the John Hancock Sun Bowl. The visit to Ireland proved an experience to be remembered for a lifetime, but its memory would have to be put aside for two weeks. Upcoming was the game. Countdown to Navy. One of the most colorful and historic traditions in all of college sports, an event that touches the lives of millions around the world, begins with the Army pregame march on. something that I mean, the greats, the Doc, Pete Dawkins and Doc Blanchard and Glenn Davis have done before you. And uh, all you see walking out there is just that image. And uh, you know you're playing in one of the nation's biggest rivalries. Since 1984, when Jim Young installed the wishbone, the cadets' rushing attack has never failed to finish among the top five in all of college football. For the fourth Navy game in a row, this offense produced no turnovers, just the precision of a cadet attack that dared an opponent to try and stop it. Sixteen plays, six and a half minutes, and Army's machine-like offense grabbed the lead in the second period. Before the end of this game, Mike Mayweather would become only the seventh Army runner to gain over a thousand yards in a season, and the first sophomore ever to do it. For both squads, this Army-Navy clash was a tough, no-holds-barred football game. When Keith Walker hit a pair of field goals, tying the school record with 15 for the season, Army edged ahead 13-9 after three tightly played periods. On defense, the cadets stymied Navy's option attack from sideline to sideline. With veterans like Pat Davey and Mike Thorson patrolling the outside, and Huff, Cooney, and Haynes clogging the middle, the middies found themselves like a battleship with no cannons. 
powerless against one of the finest bad-to-the-bone defenses in cadet history. Backed by Army's 12th man, the Corps of Cadets, Jim Young's offense showed another sellout crowd in the national CBS TV audience their discipline blocking and running. An attack that set an academy record for the most rushing yards gained in a season. In the game's final moments, this ball control offense teased the middies with a pass to tight end Doug Baker. And then simply and methodically rammed the ball into the end zone. When Brian McWilliams dove through the middies for the clincher, Army celebrated its third win in a row over Navy. The last time that happened was in the mid-1940s. For the third time in the past five years, the proud cadets returned the Commander-in-Chief's trophy to West Point. College football's greatest rivalry had been settled, giving Army its ninth victory of 1988. No academy team in history ever won more. Army's season was a rousing success. In a locker room filled with the pride of victory, this young team that had matured quickly savored its sweetest triumph. The entire 1988 season had proved that hard work and determination could bring success, and Jim Young knew these future leaders had attained their goals, had, yes, dared to win, and would proudly take their place with the great teams in Army football history. I'm proud of the effort that you put forth all year long. You accomplished all the goals you set out to accomplish. And uh, the big one was today, three straight over Navy. That doesn't come very often. Uh, yeah. And that, that's something that you'll all be proud of, in, uh, every class, because every class had a hand in that. Got to be four. And, and uh, four, the Commander-in-Chief's trophy. This means that we've won this thing three out of the last five years. We beat the Navy four out of five. We beat the Air Force three out of five. And I think that sort of brings it down to uh, we're the best. Uh, right. all yeah. Yeah. Coming off the momentum of this successful season, Army will be looking to climb even higher mountains in 1989. Uh, you stay around, food up, food up, food up.